What an amazing day so far, isn't it? These young speakers, it's incredible. Lots of ideas going around. It's awesome. My name's Ray. I'm an adventurer. Now, when you hear the word adventurer, most people automatically assume I'm some sort of mountain climber or ocean sailor, right? I'm, I have a fear of heights, and I don't like sea monsters, so I stick to the ground. I'm a runner. I'm an ultra-distance runner. I've ran across countries. I've ran across entire continents. Take in case my last expedition, I ran across Patagonia with these two guys. Now, the Patagonian desert spans South America, so I ran coast to coast over the Andes, up through this region called the Meseta. And my buddies and I, as we were running, were sharing our expedition with students around the world who were following along. Because here's the beauty of running. When you're running in these places, you can access places that you can't only get to unless you had a helicopter. You gotta run there. You can't drive into some of these places where I'm going. And you meet people, extraordinary people, when you're running in these far off places. In Patagonia, I met cowboys working the land, right? Met all sorts of amazing people. I think the most amazing person I met on this journey happened in this region called the Meseta. Now, the Meseta the center of the Patagonian desert. It's like you took the moon and inside outed it and then put it on the earth. It's like just rocks and craters. So we're running along, you know, and I, my buddies and I, and I look down, there's this giant crater, this giant hole in the earth. And in the bottom of this hole was a house. And I said to the guys, get a load of this. I wonder who lives down in the hole, right? So we thought, well, it's probably, you know, let's keep on moving. Moving along, next 20K, we're going in for a resupply to get our water and our food. And my film crew happened to be there, the folks that actually share my expeditions with the live website that we have with the students around the world who are following the journey, right? So we're coming along. There's a crater right by the checkpoint. I said, there's another house down in that hole. We got to go down there. We got to get the guys. We got to get everybody together. We got to find out who lives down in the hole. Scramble down the side. We get to the door, you know, knock on the door of this little house, and Mr. Garcia comes to the door. I got the translator, and I said, hey, he welcomes us in. We go in there, and this is what we see, this little stove. So he lives in this little cabin, got no electricity, got no gas, got nothing but this little stove, and he burns little scraps of wood he finds up in the meseta on the range, as it were. He, that's how he heats his home throughout the winter. So I'm talking. I said, how long have you been here? He said, I've been here my entire life. I said, how long is that? He said, I can't remember how old I am, so I don't know, but it's been a really long time. And I said to him, do you live here alone? He said, well, I have kids. They've all moved away. And I said, well, how many kids do you have? And he said, I'm so old, I can't remember. So this conversation carries on like this fascinating man. And he's explaining to me how he lives here down in the hole. And so we have our conversations, and he hands me some dried horse meat, which he eats. And so we're leaving. I got my dried horse meat in hand, and I'm scrambling up the side of this crater, and I forget to ask him the most important question of all. Why do you live down in this hole instead of up on the side? And Mr. Garcia said to me, Take much longer and stay here till winter, and you'll find out why, buddy. And so, of course, I got moving because it's so windy up there. That's why they live down in these craters. And I saw several other homes like that. Now, if I wasn't out there running on an adventure, I would have never met Mr. Garcia, and I would have never seen or experienced the extremeness of the Meseta or some of the things that I get to because I'm in the hottest places on earth, some of the coldest places on earth, the sandiest, the highest, the driest. The iciest places. I get to experience amazing places on this planet that don't even look like we think they would. This looks like the moon. Of course, we all know the moon is made out of cheese, so it's obviously not the moon. This was taken in Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic. Does that look like the Arctic? No, I don't think so, right? But I'm running, is the, you know, the running it gives you the experience and gives you the opportunity to see and experience so many different things. Now, one of my favorite places that I've ever been, that I ran across, was the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. I spent about a month running over 2,000 kilometers with my team across the Gobi, supported once again every 30 or so kilometers. I would get a resupply. I'm using my GPS. I'm trucking through the desert, and I got my film crew giving me water and whatever. And they're capturing the stories as I'm making my way through Mongolia of the people that I would randomly meet if they happened to be there or if they knew a spot that I should aim for, put it into my GPS and off I'd go. And so they're there creating this content and shooting it and editing it in the field for two reasons. Number one, get that content, create an archive, push it up to a website so schools can follow along. 
the expedition going into classrooms, classrooms onto the expedition virtually, great stuff. And number two, shooting for a little television series we created called To The Edge, where people get to introduce to the people that I get to meet while I'm on expedition. I brought a little clip, this is what Mongolia looks like. <laughs> 2,000 kilometer swath of Mongolia that I ran across, I ran or walked every single step. So you do get to experience at ground level truly what everybody else experiences here. I'm in the most remote part of the country. It's these amazing stories, these amazing people that really you could only come across if you were on an expedition for this length of time. But that's why we're here. You'll uh, forgive the overdramatic music, right? TV adventure guy, you know? Everything. The extremes of the planet. So I've been to some of the hottest places on Earth. This is a thermometer reading the temperature of the ground in Death Valley, California. If you press the Celsius button on the thermometer, all it says is damn hot. It doesn't give you a reading, right? And even in this most extreme of places, I crossed Death Valley National Park from the North Park to the South Park boundary off-road, like 250K. Even in the middle of Death Valley, when it's a billion degrees, because you're running, amazing things happen. There was a lightning storm, thunderstorm, and as it was raining, it started to precipitate. The rain did not make it to the ground because it was so hot. But after, of course, we were left with a rainbow. And I was with a buddy of mine, I said, give him one of these, check this out, can you believe that we're seeing this? And the terrain is not always easy in the places that I choose to run, because as you saw in that little video, I'm in the most remote parts of the world, and, you know, I'm kind of lazy. I'm going to take the straightest line I can across the desert, which usually means no trails or roads. So I got my GPS rock, and, and I'm running on rocks and stones and whatever else is in my way. And it can really beat your body up. Check, check this out. Well, it's the start of day, I think we're on day seven. And I uh, had another great day yesterday, got 70K in, uh, 40 miles. Um, but I've been nursing a blister while I've been out here. This is what it looks like, check this out. Oh, that is disgusting. Right after lunch, they should have had me on before, right? You know, hmm, what am I gonna do? From the hottest places on Earth, I've also been to some of the coldest places on Earth. This is what it looks like when you try to run across Siberia unsupported. I'm not moving too fast because I'm freezing, right? Number one. Number two, I'm hauling about 100 pounds of gear and supplies and food behind me, totally self-contained. And my buddy who's doing the exact same thing, Kevin, is shooting that video. He's got the same setup. There he is. And we're crossing Lake Baikal in Siberia in winter. But check out that photo. The ice, so clear, a meter frozen down. You can see fish frozen in the ice. It's amazing. It's like it was the fall one day and the fish got stuck, right? And you're looking at them because you're out here running and you're wondering, what the hell? I wonder how they get out of here after this deal, right? But the coldest place I'd ever been, bar none, top of the bottom of the world, the geographic South Pole. Very, very cold place. You know, on this expedition, my buddies and I trekked from Hercules Inlet, where the ocean is frozen, to the geographic South Pole, which is at about 3,000 meters. Nobody told me it was uphill till we got there. So we spent a month going uphill, hauling these 200-pound sleds with all our stuff in it. And once again, I had to pitch my buddies on it before we went on why this would be a great idea. I said, look, when are you ever going to get to dress like a 1980s rock star again, right? Pulling it together, having some fun out there. Got to have some fun. 33 days, 23 hours, 55 minutes, we're out there trekking to the South Pole. And all the while, we're crossing these precarious crevasses. I mean, you know, you cross a crevasse, and if it breaks, you lose your sled, all your gear, potentially you also can go in there. I was especially worried about losing the sled because it was my communication device. It actually was because the sled itself had a solar panel that charged the satellite equipment that enabled me to bring that expedition to students around the world live. We'd have day-to-day -day conversations, sat phone conference calls from Antarctica to students in Chicago, in Vancouver, wherever in the world they were. 
And it was an amazing experience for the students to communicate with us. And as much as it was for them, it was for us to communicate with them. We were learning from each other. One of the students called from Chicago in on this, on this conference line that we had. And we discussed how this is the world's largest desert. And he had a fascinating question for me. He said, we've been watching you for weeks trekking across the ice. Tell me where the snow comes from, genius, if you're in a desert. And I thought, what an amazing question. This is the world's largest desert, but I haven't seen it snow once. Where does the precipitation come from? It precipitates so little that some of the blocks of ice we were uh, digging down to get for our drinking water, a meter down we were digging down to get the densest snow we could to melt, fell during the time of the pharaohs. I mean, it's an unbelievably old place. Incredible. But I had an idea, and I want to show you this. I had an idea of taking young people on expeditions, giving them the reins, having them be the ones that would be the adventurer. They would be the ones with the sled attached to them, communicating with students in school, not just me. All right, well, we have no sound, so I'll tell you what's happening. You see a group of five young people in this video as part of my organization, Impossible to Possible. And what we do with Impossible to Possible is take young people between the ages of 16 and 21 on expeditions around the world. The goal of these expeditions is to inspire, educate, and empower young people in classrooms that are following along and also these young adventurers that are going on these expeditions. Now, these five young people that did this adventure, youth ambassadors, again, 16 to 21 years of age, signed up to do this thing. It's free. They train and prepare to go on their own expedition, and every expedition is learning-based. There's a curriculum attached to the expedition. Now, they got to teach that curriculum along with experts while they're out there doing their adventure. Running across the Bolivian Altiplano, what was happening in that video, the world's largest salt flat. And these, these young people ran across this salt flat, and they're an international team coming together, trained, prepared for this. They're gathering salt samples as they make their way. The subject of this expedition was chemistry. It was the International Year of Chemistry, and so we conducted chemistry experiments with that salt that they gathered, those samples that they brought together. On the left-hand side is the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies, Simon Fraser University. He's a chemist. And he's about to boil water at 11,000 feet of altitude that's salinated. They've taken the salt that the youth ambassadors have gathered, they've mixed it up, and they're going to boil water and race students using our live satellite system around the world. Students have prepared their same percentage of salination solution, and they're going to boil it at their given elevation. A race to see who boils salty water the fastest. Basic chemistry experiment brought to light. We've been into the Amazon jungle as well. This place was amazing. We studied biodiversity. It was the International Year of Biodiversity when we did this one. We dropped our youth ambassadors, center of the Amazon. They went from one indigenous community to the next, like field reporters, teaching through this live satellite system what it felt like to be in the Amazon. Check this out. Rainforest, it's pouring rain. It's exactly what I thought the rainforest would be. This has got to be the coolest day of my life. I'm just, I'm on cloud, cloud nine right now. This is awesome. Jesse's 16 years old. Sierra, 17 years old. When this expedition happened, I mean, they're trekking through swamps filled with, they got ticks all over them and everything. They're doing this incredible thing. They're challenging themselves beyond any belief, coming into contact with cultures that had they not signed up to do this challenge they never would have experienced. They'll take this with them for the rest of their lives and do extraordinary things they already are. And it's about empowerment. It's about engaging young people in the classrooms. Really that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Being on an expedition, for example, you're 17, you're running across Tunisia, you're learning the importance of water, as was the curriculum base during the Sahara expedition that we did with our youth ambassadors. How important it is to your body when you're running that far across these hot sand dunes, right? But as well, what a precious resource it is to the people of North Africa. Through their expedition, they inspired students around the globe to come together in their own fundraising efforts to build water projects in Africa. The students that followed along, were participating at arm's length on the expedition, did just that. Raised enough money through bake sales, etc., running races, to build these two projects successfully. It's about giving young people the chance to learn from their peers how extraordinary they can be. That essentially they've got their entire lives in front of them. And I love it when we're on a youth expedition because I get to share some of the stories, the things that I've learned from some of the most extreme places on the, on the planet. Not just about myself, but about my world. Check this out.
It is the most unforgiving place on Earth. Over 3.5 million square miles. A vast wilderness. It is the Sahara Desert, with people and cultures as unpredictable as the landscape. Running 50 miles a day, it's the challenge. It's going the distance. It's just pushing myself to my limits. It's never been done. No one's ever run that far in that period of time. That will be tough. It'll be some mental thing, I think. Imagine running 50 miles per day for more than 100 days. In an unprecedented personal challenge, three ultra runners, good friends, test physical strength and mental toughness running across the entire Sahara Desert. They're such high-end athletes. They're used to pushing themselves, but they're gonna be pushing their bodies more than they ever have in the past. We've had injury, we've had sickness. Sorry, dude. The best thing to do would be to stop for the day, but we have to cover some miles today. Any Americans found there without proper paperwork are gonna be considered spies, liable to execution. We're yeah. gonna have to make the best decision for us as a team. It's so difficult for me because the personalities are so different. I don't want to push us into the ground, obviously, but I'll push us damn close. This is, you know, a lot tougher than you could have ever thought. You can do this. You don't want to quit. It's OK. <laughs> we saw a young boy, seven or eight years old, in the desert alone, fending for himself while his dad was a two days walk away to get water. That's the water situation. I mean, it's so much bigger an issue than I would have ever thought. Narrated by executive producer Matt Damon and directed by James Mall, a personal and compelling journey into the world's most mysterious wilderness. The purpose of the three of us coming here was to learn more about each other, to learn about the people of the Sahara, and to do something that hasn't been done before. They all three agreed that if one runner went down, they would be out of the expedition. I thought your commitment was different than that. When is the end? The end is when we get to Cairo. When Africa is one, and we sing this song, show me the way home. Oh, I show me the way home. It don't hurt no more. It will be a life-changing experience, and not just for the three runners, for everybody who's along on this journey. I would love to share the story with our youth ambassadors that on November 1st, 2006, my two best friends and I said we were going to do something incredible. We were going to set out on a journey to run across the entire Sahara Desert. And we did it. 7,500 kilometers is how long it was. It took us 111 days to run across the Sahara, averaging 70K every single day while we were out there. Probably the most difficult part of the expedition. Two showers the entire time that we were doing this run. Can you imagine how funky we were, right? I mean, unbelievable. Can't see your buddies in a sandstorm, but you sure as hell can smell where they are, right? You know? But as our run across the Sahara Desert, you know, we got introduced to the Tuareg culture, the people of the Sahara Desert, the seriousness of the water crisis in North Africa. And as much as we learned about the people and the situation and the way that it is in North Africa, we learned about ourselves. See, I ran across the Sahara Desert with these two guys. When we reached the edge of the Red Sea, the three of us had our hands above the water. And when our hands would go in the water, it would signify the end of the expedition. And I remember looking at my hand and comparing it to my two buddies and thinking it's the same. You see, that sounds like a silly statement to make, but if you look at this photograph, that guy, me, standing there, seven years before this photograph was taken, I was smoking a pack a day, two packs a day, cigarettes, living a sedentary life, not a lifelong athlete. I started running a little over three years before this day this photograph was taken. But I made it across the Sahara Desert with these two guys. Our hands plunge into the water, and my wife, who had joined the expedition at the end, runs to me. She says, don't say anything but what comes to your mind. I said, no limits. And she said, what, you? I said, no, babe, we as human beings have no limits to what we're capable of achieving. I'm not a runner, I'm not a professional runner, yet I did this thing with these guys. I ran shoulder to shoulder with them across the Sahara. We totally underestimate ourselves and what we're capable of doing. So what are you going to do about it? I said, I'm going to start an organization that takes young people on expeditions. Because I remember being 16 years old and not giving a damn what my teacher had to say. But I learned significant things at middle age. No regrets. 
But why not learn at 16 and 17 what you can do, that you can be extraordinary, that you can learn, you can have amazing experiences, challenge yourself, and take from that. The organization is called Impossible to Possible because I have a philosophy. It's something that I believe in with every fiber of my being. That every one of us is capable of the extraordinary if we choose to do so. If we're willing to work hard, we can make pretty much anything in our lives happen. And if you believe in that philosophy, if we believe in that philosophy, I honestly think that we're freed from all boundaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.